Hey guys, this is lecture video 4 of CSE 2000 Q2S Computer Science 2, taught by Lawrence Orihuela, and my name is Lawrence Orihuela. Uh, today we're going to be talking about arrays and vectors, so uh, let's get started. So we are going down the line here. Today is September 18th, and we'll, we'll be talking about arrays and vectors, which is two very useful things to use in C++, especially when you're handling um, large groups of data. Now, uh, tonight you have two things due. The first one is your activity three about user defined functions, and the second item is your lab one, uh, which covers data types, input output, arithmetic control and loops. So uh, please get these in before midnight tonight. And then your activity for arrays and vectors will be due midnight of next week. And uh, by the time we're finished talking about arrays and vectors, uh, you should have everything you need to finish lab two. But as usual, we're going to have a, a lab meeting discussion on Zoom uh, for those that uh, are going to need uh, assistance with lab two. Uh, but uh, without any further ado, let's get started. So, okay, so uh, a brief thing about Lab 1. Uh, I'm going to pull up Lab 1 right now. So, uh, Lab 1 is right here on your blackboard. If you click that, uh, this should pop up. So, uh, if you haven't already done this already, uh, please do so. So, this lab covers input output data types control and arithmetic and your task is an amusement park has hired you to program the ticket dispenser for the new roller coaster and it must meet the following requirements uh, the requirements are right here uh, coding this is actually quite easy and I even put a couple tips here in, in case uh, you might find them useful and the instructions to submit they're the exact same thing we do with the activities except you just put lab one instead of uh, acts number instead, and then uh, please put your code right here so that I can see it. Now, uh, if for some reason you're struggling with lab one, if you go to uh, labs on the Blackboard page, you'll see uh, we talked about uh, lab one in this meeting on which we had on the fourth, and I actually recorded it and I put the video here for those who want to see it. So. Uh, if you're struggling, please watch this video. It might help you out. But if you're really, really struggling, w which I doubt you are because this lab's easy, but if you are, uh, please email me and we can talk about it. Okay? So, yeah. I'm going to put this here. So, let's continue. So, arrays. So, uh, data types actually fall into three categories. We have simple data types, structured data types, and pointers. Up until now, we've covered simple data types, and you know what they are. There's int, double, car, string, bool, uh, so on. Now, array is one form of structured data types, and it's actually the first structured data type that we're going to discuss in this class. Now, structured data types hold a collection of other data types. Uh, other structured data types include vectors, structs, classes, etc. Uh, all of these we're going to cover eventually. Now the syntax for an array is listed here in this gray box. You have your data type, you say your array name, and then n represents the size of the array. Okay? Now, do you see this program uh, to the to the right here? So we have five different test scores, right? Now we could uh, hold our data like this, but probably a more efficient way of holding this data would be to declare an array of type int of size five. Uh, that would be a more efficient way of holding our data. So moving forward, so arrays, like all data types, can be declared initialized with its value set equal to something or 
uninitialized with its values uh, not equal to anything. Although, if it was uninitialized, you would have to set their values later. The same way you would uh, any other data type, you know? So the syntax for an uninitialized array is like this. So you have your data type, your array name, the size here, and then you set it equal to, and inside squiggly brackets, you list n items. So you got item one, item two, all the way to item n because n is the size of this array, okay? Now, if you had an uninitialized array, like say you don't know what the values are yet, uh, you, can, you can just have the data type here, the array name and the size, and you can just uh, cut it off with a semicolon. But if you, this was the case, you would have to populate the array later. So moving forward, okay, so uh, with everything we know, we're ready to begin the lecture activity. So 1A, declaring an uninitialized array. Oh, my bad, an initialized array. So say you're writing an array to hold five students' test scores for test one in your class. You already know what they are, and they're listed here. Uh, 55, 65, 75. Uh, declare an initialized array that holds these values. So let's get Visual Studio fired up. Uh, C++ empty project. I want to save this right here. So we are going to add our main.cpp. Let's make this bigger. And then we're going to add our typical C++ jargon. So include iostream. Uh, I think in this activity we're going to use strings later. So I'm going to include string. And then we're going to use using name space standard. And name. OK, so let's recall what it asks us to do. So uh, declare an array to hold these five values now because the values are already determined. This is an initialized array. Now, the thing that I was saying about, before about initialize and uninitialize is like, uh, say you had, we, we've been doing this before. Like, say you had a string name. Uh, this variable name is uninitialized because it's not equal to anything. But we would have to set it equal to something later in the program. And to initialize it, we set it equal to something like that now now name is initialized now it's trickier to do it with an array because an array holds multiple values okay but the syntax is as follows so uh, we just declare the data type the array name the size and then in squiggly brackets each item so it's gonna be a type int uh, we're going to call it test one scores. Uh, and this is going to be an array of size five. And in squiggly brackets, we'll put the values 55, 65, 75, 85, and 95. OK. So here's my array. Um, so to show you what these values look like. Um, we would have to see out them one by one. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to see out test one scores. And line see out. Now, if you wanted to access the members of an array, 
Um, there's something important that I need to tell you. Um, you would actually need to say the array name test one scores and then using uh, square brackets uh, inside the square brackets you indicate the position of the item which you in which you wish to access now uh, one thing that you need to know is that the the objects of an array are numbered starting from zero and uh, to show you what I mean by that I'm gonna actually do this Oh shoot. Why did I decide to do that? <laughs> oh. Because the tab key was stuck on my keyboard. Because I was doing it too hard. My bad. So, um, so, see this 55 here? This is actually item number 0 in the array. The next item is uh, item number 1, then 2, then 3, then 4. So, this is very important to keep in mind. Uh, objects of an array are numbered from zero. Even though there's five objects here, the object numbers are zero, one, two, three, and four. So if you wanted to see objects, if you wanted to see this 55, this object here, you would have to put zero in the square brackets. And then here's what I'll do. I'll, I'll put a space so that uh, you can see it. So I'm gonna run this. This should output 55. Which it does. So I'm gonna repeat this code four more times. But I'm gonna, if you wanted to see each one, you would have to set this equal to one, then two, then three, then four. And uh, also, this is part 1a, right? Which is declaring an initialized array. So part 1a. Okay, so if we ran this, we can see everything. Okay, and I'm actually gonna put some spaces here, see how it's. Okay, so this is part 1a. Uh, let's see what else we, we got here. Okay, so so uh, lecture activity one B is declaring an uninitialized array. So now now you're writing an array to hold the five student scores for test two in your class. Uh, you don't know what they are yet because they haven't taken the test yet. Okay, now. It says declare an uninitialized array that holds these values. Then write a for loop that allows you to input these val values manually. Okay, so that's quite easy. So what, here's what we're gonna do. See out part one b. So we're going to have a brand new array called uh, int test2 scores. So int test2 scores. It's going to be a size 5 again, but this time it's uninitialized. Now, here's the way that I would approach doing this. Uh, we could uh, prompt the user to enter the values one by one using cin, but I think a more efficient way to do that is to use a for loop. Does that sound okay with you guys? So here's what I'll do. Here's our for loop. For int i equals zero. This loop will continue until i is less than five is no longer true. 
and each time we iterate, we will increment i. Okay. So we'll just see out. Uh, please enter the test score for item uh, i. Well, actually, let's do this. Let's put a bracket here, and then closing square bracket there. Colon. So C in uh, test two scores at number i. So this should uh, pull everything. Now, in order to see what these values look like, uh, I'm actually going to have to uh, do something that's similar to this. So here's what I'll do. I'll copy this, put it here, but I'm going to make some slight changes. We're going to call this test two scores, and we're going to copy that over here. Okay? so. Let's run this and see if this works. Well, actually, first I need to put some space here. Okay. So let's run this. Okay. So it says, please enter test score for item zero. Uh, we can we can uh, have them be any values we want. So I'm gonna say. 85 for test score one, maybe 65 for the next one, uh, 93, 81, 8. Cool. So by doing this, uh, we we give the user the power to set the the array objects equal to anything we want. And uh, now, here's the thing. Um, you could choose not to use an array. You could just have uh, individual uh, int values for each test score. But that's kind of inefficient, right? Uh, it would be much better to use an array when it's appropriate to do so. Because uh, doing so, by, by grouping data into uh, structured data types, it makes our data easier to manage instead of if we were to declare variables one by one. Does that make sense? So as a programmer, it's up to you to decide when it's appropriate to use an array. OK? So we did 1a and 1b. Let's proceed. So OK, so this is what I was talking about. So um, when you declare an array of five objects, uh, the, the numbering is going to start from zero. So you have your zeroth object, your first object, your second object, and so on. Now, um, the reason why uh, arrays are numbered from zero is because um, if you ever looked inside of your computer's memory, uh, the, the computer's memory addresses are numbered from zero because uh, you have, you have uh, memory address 0, then memory address 1, and then all the way to how uh, whatever how much memory you have in your computer. So the reason why we start from 0 is that, so that uh, the memory addresses for our computer and the and the item number for the arrays uh, uh, they line up. And that's actually the only reason why array uh, values start from 0. Just thought I'd share that with you. So moving forward. So in order to access the items in an array, you would use the following syntax. So you save the array name here. And then in square brackets, you put the, the number n, where n is the position of the, of the object that you're, which you're trying to access. So we can actually demonstrate that 
in the next part of the lecture activity, which is changing members of an array. So we're going to continue using the uh, array that we made for test two scores. So say you accidentally entered the fourth student's test score wrong, and it's actually 90. So write a line of code to change it. And then after that, now say you're adding a curve of seven points to everyone. Write a for loop that will add seven to each score of test two. OK? So here's what I'm, I'm going to do. Let's close this, go back here. And this was C out part one C, which is changing members of an array. Okay. So we're going to use test two scores again. So, um, so we're going to change uh, the fourth student's test score to ninety. So that's real easy. Change fourth score to ninety. Now, the fourth score is actually position number three in the array. So I'm going to have to actually say test to score square bracket at three equals 90. And that's how you change the values of an array. Actually, this should be scores. Scores. So there's that. And then the other thing was what again? So now you're adding a curve of seven points to everyone. Write a for loop that'll add seven to each score of test two. Okay, so that's very easy too. So I'm gonna say add curve of seven points. So we're gonna need a for loop again. So for int i equals zero, i is less than five because there's five objects in the array i plus plus so here's how i would do it so test two scores equals oh, oh, at item i will be equal to itself plus seven and that's how you do it now you could probably be saying another a probably more efficient way to do it would be to say uh, test two scores plus equals seven uh, this actually accomplishes the same thing but uh, if it's easier to visualize it like this um, that's probably better. So I'm actually going to delete that, uncomment this. So let's see if, uh, if we, if this works, if we're able to change the members of our array. So let's add uh, dummy numbers again. So So let's see what we got. Hmm. Uh, oh, my, my bad. I, I forgot to actually see out everything again. So here's what I'm going to do. That, yeah, that's why you didn't see the changes. So I, I actually have to copy this code again. So I'll take this and put it on the bottom here. So let's run it. Sorry about that. So uh, let's let's take a moment and analyze what happened here. So here's what our test scores, test two scores was before. Now we did two things. One, we changed the fourth test score to 90. So this actually changed to 90. And then we added seven, seven points to everybody. So 87 plus seven gets 94. 
uh, 56 plus 7 is 63. Uh, we changed this to 90, and then 90 plus 7 is 97. So, yeah, there. Uh, that's how you change uh, the members of an array if you if you need to change them uh, later in whatever program you're writing, okay? So, so, to be honest, using an array is very simple. Uh, I think I talked about about pretty much everything that I wanted to hear. So, uh, the next thing that we're going to talk about is vectors, which is, um, I find that in my programming, like in my computer science career, I use vectors way more than I use arrays, simply because it's it's more fle flexible. Uh, well, you'll see what I mean when I get into it. So, so here we go. Although arrays are useful, uh, they have limitations, including the following. So, the size of an array remains static throughout the program. So, if you recall in the previous ac activities, uh, we used arrays of size 5. And because we set it equal to 5, we can't change it. Uh, we can't change it to 4 or 6. It has to be exactly 5 members. Okay? Now, um, so you might want to use an array uh, in the situation in which you're keeping track of students' test scores. But uh, say this happens. Say that a student dropped the class. How are you going to stop using uh, that... that uh, object there in the position where it's where it's in uh, you can't get rid of that so because of that arrays they're probably not gonna be the structured data type of your choosing unless you know for a fact that uh, the size of the container remains static throughout the program then that's when you use them and the other problem with arrays is that you can't really retrieve the size of, of an array if you need to know it well there, there actually is a way, but it's kind of unintuitive, and I'm actually not going to go into this. So, if these two problems are going to get in the way when you're writing your program, uh, it's probably a better idea to use a vector instead. So, a vector is another form of structured data type, and it's very similar to an array. Uh, the only difference is the data in a vector is stored dynamically. Meaning if the size of the members is increased or decreased, the compiler, the C++ compiler, will readjust it accordingly. You can't do this for an array whose uh, length is fixed. So, so to use a vector, um, it has its own library, so we're going to have to include vector at the very top, okay? Then to declare a vector, here's the syntax here in this uh, gray box. So we say vector, and then using uh, chevrons, we say data type, and then the name of the vector. So it's quite simple, actually. So uh, now... Uh, the vector library has a series of different functions that we can use. So these are operations to get the size of a vector, and the description tells us what the what they do. So um, if we wanted to know if the vector was empty or not, uh, we would say the vector name dot empty, and because this is a function, we would put parentheses in front of it. So uh, I know we covered user defined functions last week, but all functions have to have parentheses in front of it, like this. Now, this function here returns true if the vector is empty, but false if it's not empty. Okay? Now, uh, this could be useful uh, if you're writing a program and you need to work with a vector, but you need to know if the vector is filled with any data first before you can work on it. Now, the other operation that I want to discuss is dot size. So this function here returns the number of elements in the vector in the form of int. So if there were five members in a vector, 
it would return the int 5. If there were uh, 1,000 items in the vector, it would return 1,000. Now, this is actually very useful. I, I imagine that you're going to be using this operation quite a lot. And I even put a note on the bottom here. Do you see, do you see the dot size function? Like that? Arrays can't do that. Now, uh, despite the fact that vectors are more powerful than arrays, using vectors, uh, because of how, I guess, complicated they are, relatively speaking, they actually take more processing power than using arrays. So, uh, as a programmer, you, wh one thing you should learn is uh, when to use vectors and when to use arrays. Because if you, can't, if you can use an array to hold your data, use it because it takes up less processing power than the vector does. But again, most of the time you're going to be using vectors. So, uh, lecture activity for declaring a vector. So uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to declare a vector of strings that holds names of fruits. And I, I just completely made this up. So we're, we're going to make a vector that holds fruit names. Uh, don't push any members to the vector yet. Then use dot empty and dot size to see what values they hold. Okay, so here. I'm going to make this bigger so you can see it. Now this is part Let's see out. Part two A declaring a vector. So the syntax for making a vector is very simple. You say vector string we're gonna call it fruit names so we have our vector why is it oh my bad <laughs> I have to include vector at the top forgot about that okay great so as of now the vector named fruit names, it actually contains no objects. So if we were to uh, do what it says here, use empty and dot size. So I'm going to say uh, C out size. My bad. Size fruit names dot size and then parentheses because this is a function and line and then I'll do it I'll repeat this again for is empty so see how it's is empty root names dot empty now, because this returns a bool, uh, this will actually, so this would evaluate to one if it's true, but zero if it's false. Now, because as of now, fruit names doesn't control, doesn't contain any objects, size should be equal to zero and empty should be true. So if we run this, oh. Actually, probably a good idea before running this would be to comment parts 1b and 1c out so that they don't get in the way. So I'm actually going to run this again. So right now size is zero that makes sense because right now this vector doesn't contain anything and is empty is equal to one which evaluates the true which makes sense because it's empty okay so here is the part where we're going to start populating the array uh the way we actually 
we actually move members to a vector is by using the pushback function. So if you actually go to this slide here, right there. So these are all the operations that we can use on the vector. Uh, we have the clear function, which deletes all the items from it. We have erase, we have insert, but, but uh, if you wanted to put uh, information in the vector, the the function you would use is called pushback. So the way it works is that you say vector name dot pushback, and in parentheses you put an element here, and then a copy of the element is inserted at the end of the vector. So here's what we're gonna do. So use dot pushback to add as many fruit names as you like to vector fruit names. So this is going to be part part to be pushing to a vector. So we're going to say the name of the vector, which is fruit names dot push back. So inside of these parentheses, uh, we, we should put uh, a name of a fruit in there. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to put a whole bunch of fruit names in there. So we're, the first one I'm going to put is apple and then say orange banana uh, what else kiwi pear and uh just for the sake of example let's um for the sake of the activity let's put an object here that isn't an apple or, 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 or a fruit so let's let's say maybe pizza <laughs> or something okay so, oh, you know, I, I actually just realized something. So, um, you're actually not going to see this unless I see out of them like I did for the arrays, like that. And that's actually going to, that's actually a lot of code to write. So, here's an idea. Instead of see outing them individually, uh, because we learned user-defined functions in the previous lecture, I'm going to write a user-defined function that accepts a vector of strings and then prints each member. Because, uh, you know, I, I can do that. So uh, void, what do we want to name this function? So print vector of strings. So this is going to accept a vector of type string, and I'm going to name it v. So uh, because I'm repeating of the same process over and over, I would I would need to use a for loop. So for int i equals zero, i is less than and here's where the size function is useful. V dot size. Like that. And then I plus plus. So this loop would actually iterate uh, as many times as uh, as the size of the vector, which is very useful. So over here in the bottom, I'm going to see out. And I named this vector v, so I have to call it v. So v at item i, and then I'll output a space. And then lastly, I would have to copy this function prototype and stick it at the very top right here, add a semicolon, delete this name.
Cool. So now I have a user defined function that prints a vector of strings. So here's what I'll do. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna use that function here. Print vector strings. Uh, and we're gonna pass the vector fruit names to it. And actually, you know what? For the sake of example, I should actually put this over here as well. Now, if I called this function uh, directly after declaring uh, this line here, uh, because the because the the vector is empty, size would evaluate to zero, so this for loop actually wouldn't iterate at all. So it would see out nothing. But that's okay. I, I just wanted to put the just here just, just to illustrate that to you. Now, what else did I say to do in this activity? Okay. Add as many fruit names as we want and then use dot empty and dot size again to see what values they hold. So looks like I'm gonna take these two lines here. And I'll actually put them right here. Okay? So let's run this again and see what we have. Hmm. I should put lines here so you can see. And then here too. Okay, so if you look here, um, when we first declared the vector, it had zero items in it and it was empty. But after pushing six items to it, so now this now the size of the vector is six. It's not empty anymore. And here are the six items it uh, contains: apple, orange, banana, kiwi, pear, pizza. Okay, so. Uh, there's that part there. Just wanted to show that to you. And then lastly, after that. So uh, the last things I want to illustrate to you is the pop back function and the dot clear function. So if you go back to this slide here, so pop back, uh, it deletes the item that's at the end of the vector. Okay. And then the dot clear function deletes all of the elements from the container. Okay, so uh, let's actually use those functions now. So I'm gonna go over here. This is part two C. Two C, and we call this popping from a vector. And we're going to use the name of vector fruit names dot pop back. And this is a function that uh, takes no parameters. So uh, this is actually the reason why I wanted to put uh, I wanted to add pizza to the vector because Pizza is not a fruit. We're going to have to delete that. So that's exactly what pop back will do because pizza is the last item in the vector. Uh, after we pop back, uh, pizza will be gone. Okay. Now to prove that to you, we're going to print the vector again. So I'm going to use my user defined function print vector pass fruit names to it, and then. We'll run this. Okay, so after the compiler reaches here, pop back, the last item is removed. So if we printed our vector again, uh, we can see indeed the last item is removed.
Okay. So the last thing I want to show you is the dot clear function. So uh, let's call this C out part to D. I'm going to call it clearing a vector. So if in your program you needed to clear your vector and uh, fill it with new data, the dot clear function is what you would use. So and line root names dot clear. And then we're uh, because I'm lazy, I'm just going to copy these two lines and uh, put them here. So after calling the clear function, fruit names is going to be empty, which means if we printed it again, uh, we're going to see no objects because it's empty. So I'll run this and let's see. Yep, because uh, uh, because we emptied all of the objects from the container, fruit names is now empty, which means what, that when we printed it, it printed nothing. So that was actually everything that I wanted to show you. Okay. Now, uh, here's the thing. I actually had more that I wanted to show you. You do you see, do you see all of these functions here? Uh, I, I demonstrated clear and push back and pop back. But I, I didn't demonstrate uh, erase or insert here. Now, um, the reason why I'm not showing these to you yet is because uh, you see these position variables here. Um, operations that use position must be of type iterator. And the thing is, uh, we wouldn't actually be learning about iterators until after we talk about pointers. And we're not going to talk about pointers until we're going to talk about pointers. Oh, my bad. This is the old schedule when I was when I was making this uh, lecture. Um, let me pull up the syllabus. So we're going to talk about pointers next week. OK? So uh, after we, we learn about pointers and iterators, uh, that is the time when uh, that, that is the time when I, I'm going to demonstrate these other vector functions to you. But uh, if we proceed, oh, so that that's actually the, the end of the activity. So here's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to comment all this. I'm going to uncomment all this. So all of this is your activity for this week. So I'm going to run it again. Here's what I want you to do. Put any uh, put any numbers into this. So uh, you already know what to do. So get a screenshot of this. Yeah. And uh, put four comments on the top. Lecture activity four. Name SID. do next week which is the 25th so 9 25 20 uh, go to your email make a new email post the screenshot on the body uh, 
add the uh, add the CPP file and send it to me. This is CSE two thousand Q two S Act four, and that's how you send it to me. Okay, so now we're completely done with the activity. So the last thing that I want to talk about is uh, Lab Two. So uh, I've decided that we're gonna have another Zoom meeting for Lab Two. Uh, on Friday on the 25th, which is exactly one week from today. And I'm going to be uh, providing help to uh, those who need it. So if you need help on Lab 2, uh, please show up to this Zoom meeting. I'm going to be sending in a link via email. So keep an eye out for that. So um, we can actually look at Lab 2 right now if we wanted to. So here's Lab 2. Okay, so this lab covers the following. We have arrays and user-defined functions. Uh, both of these things that we already covered. So here's your task. You are an instructional student assistant and you are writing a C++ program that analyzes uh, student test scores, there are, which is actually the, the same kind of thing uh, that we were doing in the, the lecture activity. So uh, please rewatch this video if need be, if you need to. Uh, brush up on this so um, so there are five arrays representing five students each having five test scores to complete this task you must accomplish the following so under test students test scores create another array called student six test scores so I created five arrays here make another array called student six test scores and inside the squiggly brackets put five integers, uh, you can set them equal to anything. Yeah, I even said that here. For the five int values, you can, you can make them up. Now, um, there are three user-defined functions declared, but they are not yet defined. Finish defining them. For get highest for students, it accepts an array of five ints, traverses them, and then returns the highest int. Uh, for, and these, over here is the user defined functions, okay? So um, for the function named get lowest for student, it accepts an array of five ints, traverses them, and returns the lowest ints. For get average for student, it accepts an array of five ints, traverses them, adds the five values together, then divides the total by five to get the average test score. Uh, this average should be returned as a double because uh, since we're dividing, you know, it makes sense that. Uh, there might be like a remainder afterwards so please uh please have this average output as a double so after defining them try running the program for student one to see if they work after you ver verify that the use defined functions accomplished their designated tasks repeat the same structure on lines 63 to 67 for the other students including your student six so now when i say uh Line 63 to 67. I'm referring to this, these lines here. So after you write these user defined functions, what I'd like you to do is these lines here, you copy this five more times, but you change student one to student two, then three, then four, all the way to six. Now, this should be a very easy lab, but again, uh, I'm going to have a uh, Zoom meeting on the 25th for those who need it. So keep an eye out for that. So anyways, that's all I have for this week. Um, so, uh, so that's pretty much it. So I will see you next week and we are going to discuss pointers and iterators. Uh, see ya.